So welcome to the NAGT webinar series. Uh, we have increased and excitedly expanded the webinar series. Um, the series is now a comprehensive one-stop shop for strengthening work in earth education. Um, we have a variety of different partners and new, um, and new programming to highlight novel and innovative work throughout earth education, research, pedagogy, new teaching materials, um, and really trying to interact with all, all of you. Um, the webinar series is free and we encourage you to invite your colleagues and attend and join as many as you can. Um, all of our webinars are also recorded so you can always go back and look at them later. Um, on your screen right now you'll see a number of links to the upcoming schedule, the past um, archives where you can find all the different recordings, um, and then the webinar homepage as well, and our sponsoring projects that have webinars throughout the webinar series. Um, next slide, and today we are super excited to have Solve Climate by 2030 um, presented by Evan Gustin and David Blockstein, and I will hand it over to them. Well, thank you, Andrew, uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Evan Gustin, and I'm Director of Graduate Programs in Sustainability at Bard College, and uh, David um, is working with us on this project, solveclimateby2030.org, um, which we want to tell you about today. Uh, and the motivating sort of issue here is uh, pessimism, if you will, about our ability to actually solve climate by 2030. Um, and what we want to engage you within is a dialogue today about how that actually might be more possible than people think. Um, but that it will only come to fruition if there is widespread civic engagement uh, from our students and citizens across the planet. Um, and what we're gonna be proposing today is an opportunity to get uh, all of your faculty um, at your various institutions um, a, a very easy way to engage in, in climate dialogue, uh, specifically on the evening of April 7th. Um, so uh, David and I will get more deeply into that, um, but we hope on that day to have hundreds of thousands of American students uh, uh, involved in a discussion about solving climate by 2030 um, and uh, in a tailored way because we're going to be actually developing conversations at the state level that your students can hook into. So uh, that's the agenda for today and um, again all of this is motivated by the IPCC report from last year. Um, and we ran this project because we felt like, well, we can't let this one go, right? This can't just be another report that just disappears onto the shelf. As educators, we really have an obligation to figure out how we're gonna get all of our students, and not just the few that are trickling through our classes, to actually be understanding kind of the extraordinary moment in which we're living. So um, in order to frame this in a solutions sort of oriented dialogue and not kind of the world is coming to an end dialogue, um, it was incumbent on us to develop a story about how we actually might solve climate by 2030. And I want to spend 10 minutes taking you through that story. It's just one story, but I think it's a compelling one. Um, and it really has emerged only in the last couple of years as a, a realistic pathway. Um, so what do we mean when we say solve climate? Well, it means that by 2030, we're well on our way towards a 100% renewable energy economy. Uh, that means we're getting our electric power from solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and really importantly, at this moment in time, has been the emergence of storage. Uh, and we have in our phone, um, but, uh, uh, I just got an internet connection is unstable. David, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we, you, there was a little glitch, okay. uh, but you're okay now. I'm back now. Okay, good. So batteries have emerged kind of as uh, a technology that is cheap and getting cheaper and is really enabling the possibility of a truly 100% renewable economy because you know, as I said, we're thinking really just the technology that's in our phone, but scaled up to whole buildings full of batteries that can store large amounts of power. Um, and that allows us to really create, a, you know, a firm uh, sort of 24 seven um, and even 365 uh, solution out of renewables. 
Um, there's other storage technologies, uh, but really for the next decade, it's going to be that batteries are going to allow us to make a rapid transition to renewables. Um, and then also, we've got to see transportation transitioning rapidly towards electric vehicles. So that's the vision. How do we get that done in 10 years? If we do that, then we've solved the energy half of climate change, right? So that's what we mean when we say solve climate by 2030. You know, there's still deforestation, land use, uh, aviation fuel, cement production, cargo transport. But this is really the huge piece that we can get done in the next 10 years. Uh, we're talking about solar as the solution, the primary solution here. We coined the term solar dominance. That just means the point at which half of our global electric power is produced by solar and storage. And uh, why solar dominance? Why not renewables dominance or nuclear dominance or wind dominance? And the answer is that solar plus batteries have got this very unique characteristics. And the main one is that they're, get, they're cheap and getting cheaper. And so by the mid 2020s, distributed solar plus storage in many places is going to be cheaper than power from the grid. All right. And by distributed, I mean rooftop, but not just residential. I mean commercial, industrial, warehouses, on farms and community solar, and, uh, and roadside medians, and pretty much everywhere you could imagine putting it. Um, and unlike with other electricity sources, you don't need a utility to produce this. Every other power source, you've got to have a utility, you've got to have the grid. And if the utilities don't want to play here, then millions and millions of people and companies can and will start producing and storing their own power. And that's really what's unique about solar. So we got the folks out in California right now. You can bet in the next couple of years, there's going to be an incredible boom in solar plus storage because those folks are now living with the reality that they're not going to have firm power, you know, for significant portions of, of the summer and fall. Um, and so climate change in this case is driving the, this demand uh, because it's already disrupting the conventional power production systems. All right. So solar dominance means a future where every factory, warehouse, business, building, shopping center, house, parking lot, farm, device, everywhere will have solar. Um, and this is coming much sooner than people thought four or five years ago or two or three years ago. This is a slide from Tony Siba, who's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and Stanford professor. And he's got a great video about how this can unfold quickly. Um, but it's not just SEBA. So as people are seeing the trends in the cost of solar and storage declining, many analysts are moving into a recognition that this will be the future of the human energy system. Um, the CEO of Shell Oil, uh, analysts at McKinsey, they're all seeing a solar dominant future sometime in the next few decades. And the question is, can we get there much sooner than that? How fast could we actually get there? Here's the reason again, so this is solar pricing. Two facts, and one is that since we've been producing solar back in the 70s, pretty much every year with one small period of exception, solar prices have declined by 10% a year, every year. 10% a year, every year. And every two years, the amount of solar on the planet has doubled, and that's the most important fact to keep in mind. Every two years, the amount of solar on the planet has doubled. This has led to a situation where California residents are going to be getting uh, power, uh, uh, rooftop power at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour in the next year or so. I mean, I pay 18 cents, the average is 14 cents. So that is the consequence of this incredibly rapid price decline. Same things happening with batteries. Um, prices are falling as we scale them up to meet the increased growth of electric vehicles and, and just the technology is improving. So here's the situation. Right. This is the grid. Average prices today about 13, 14 cents in the U.S. and getting more expensive because the grid is old. It needs maintenance. We've got to invest in it to make it smart, to accommodate all these new options. And already today at the utility scale in the Western United States and in many places in the world, utility scale solar, so big solar farms that are feeding util uh, electricity in the grid, are already crushing fossil fuels. Already. Right. So we're getting bids in, in Los Angeles and Colorado and Idaho of solar power at three cents a kilowatt hour, you know, 2.8 cents, 2.2 cents a kilowatt hour, just incredibly cheap. And the best that Fossil has been able to do for four and a half cents. So already utility scale solar is becoming the dominant uh, player for new power. 
But what really gets interesting is when the same dynamic starts to play out with distributed plus batteries. And that's going to happen in many markets in the next couple of years. Uh, it's going to reach grid parity and then start getting cheaper, unsubsidized. And that is the real recipe for market disruption. So we're going to get people in California and elsewhere. I mean, I've done it already. I'm defecting from the grid, right? I've got my own solar system producing my own power. I'll get my own batteries in the next couple of years. And increasingly, that will be how people will get their power. Uh, this could lead to utility death spiral, right? As people are no longer paying money to the utilities, they won't have the resources to support the grid. That'll be a justice issue because if it's just companies and middle class and wealthy people who are defecting, we've got to make sure that low income folks uh, have access to cheap and reliable power. But you're not going to do that by outlawing solar. Uh, so we'll have to deal with it from a public policy perspective. And the bottom line is, remember how we used to use telephone wires, right? That I ask students, you know, when I'm speaking at Central Washington University, how many of you have used a landline in the last month and, you know, one hand went up, right? So we had this whole infrastructure out there that we relied heavily on 20 years ago that has essentially become stagnant. And that is the future of the grid, right? It's not going to happen as fast because cities will still be dependent on the grid and, and sort of industrial uh, companies will be dependent on, on the grid. But increasingly, people will be moving off the grid. And, and that's exciting. I mean, this is going to end energy poverty in the developing world. Billions of people are going to get access to cheap power that they didn't have before. It's going to break the backs of the political power of the fossil fuel industries and the utility industries that have had a stranglehold on our energy systems in the 20th century. Um, and more generally, we're just moving into a new era where we're gonna be able to tap, and already are starting to tap cheaply, the sort of incredible power that the sun delivers, which just dwarfs anything that nuclear fossil can give us. So it's, it's a very exciting and sort of hopeful moment, but again, we gotta have it by 2030, right? That's the, that's the rub. You could technically get there, you just have to, play out those trends that I talked about, a solar doubling every two years. And if those trends continue, and the reason it would was because they'd be getting cheaper and cheaper, and it would be highly profitable for firms to invest in this technology and finance the growth, then by 2028, you get there. You get to solar dominance, 64% of today's electrical needs being delivered by solar plus storage. Now, as Tony Siebel likes to say, this is really easy to do in a PowerPoint slide. Um, you just hit the button six times, and you can imagine lots of reasons why this wouldn't happen, right? Would there be enough raw materials to produce this much solar? Would there be enough workers to install it? Wouldn't the utilities really try to stop it? You know, wouldn't somebody across from a farm really not want those solar panels there because they want to see cows? And yes, they, all those, right? But we just want to suggest that an alternative is possible, right? I mean, we're familiar with technologies that go from, you know, zero to 60 or 70% market share in a decade. Um, if you'd asked anybody in 2007 and asked professional analysts in 2007, how many people do you think will have a smartphone, you know, a computer in their pocket in 2017, 10 years later, you never would have, and no one said two and a half billion people, right? No one said a third of the population on the planet. So what we're suggesting is that solar plus storage could be one of these disruptive technologies that, uh, that really gets us pretty far along the path towards uh, solving climate by 2030 within 10 years. All right, so bear with me. We've got the renewal piece check. We got that done. What about cars? Because that's the other big piece. Could we do that in 10 years? Um, well, we'd have to have a very rapid gasoline to EV transition. Could we do that by 2030? Well, the auto industry gets this is their future. I mean, you know, China's banning internal combustion engines. Um, Mercedes-Benz last month at the Frankfurt Auto Show said they have designed their last internal combustion engine. Mercedes-Benz will never again build a gasoline-powered car or design a new one. Um, so, you know, the auto industry gets this, but it's not going to happen by, you know, EVs get cheaper and better and, and my next car is an EV. Right, that one-to-one that -one transition, way too slow to get us where we need to get by 2030. So we need something disruptive. And that disruptive thing could be autonomous rideshare. So driverless 
Ubers and Lyfts. Before you say, well, maybe by 2050, this is um, Phoenix, Arizona, where Waymo, which is a Google offshoot, they have a commercial app, right? which you can dial up on your phone, you can call up one of these driverless vans and it will come pick you up at your house and it will take you anywhere you wanna go in the city of Phoenix and nobody will touch the, the steering wheel. Right? So this is co commercially in existence already in the United States. And it, it's clearly where lots of money thinks that the future is going, right? So Uber, Lyft, we had the, the big IPOs this summer, $120 billion went in those companies. And everybody knows they're not gonna make money as, traffic, as, as taxi companies paying drivers, right? The only way they're gonna be justify those investments is if one of those companies gets to driverless first. Um, Lyft said in their IPO papers that they thought half of their rides by the mid, late 2020s would be driverless. But reason to think we'll get there much sooner because this is one of those first one wins markets. And the reason people are pouring billions into this space is they believe that, you know, they're going to be the next Amazon, Google, whatever. Everybody who's in the space now is already going electric because on a life cycle basis, it's already cheaper to go with EVs because they last much longer. So we've got 500,000 million and we're headed to million mile EVs. So you can buy one EV or two or three internal combustion engine cars. So it will be an EV driverless future. Will it explode? Is that possible? Well, go back to Tony Siba. He believes that the technology will be ready to go broadly in 2021. Uh, when the regulators say yes, we can get out of you know, flat gridded Phoenix and into complex Seattle or New York or Atlanta. Um, and at that moment, the economics he believes will be this. If you're thinking about buying a new car, you could pay $900 a month. And that's all in with lease, maintenance, insurance, gas. Um, or you could go with a subscription model and pay $100 a month for a rideshare subscription. All right? That's a 10x difference. And what SEBA has shown is that anytime you get a new technology entering a market that's 10 times cheaper than the incumbent, that's a recipe for incredibly rapid disruption. That's a horse to car kind of disruption that happened in 10 years. And he thinks that if it gets started in 2021, it'll all be over by 2030, right? So 95% of passenger miles uh, now going over to by 2030 in driverless uh, vehicles, driverless fleet-like vehicles, and you can see what happens in new car sales, right? Nobody's buying new cars in the US incredibly disruptive from an economic point of view. And nobody believes what I just told you, right? <laughs> nobody believes that in 10 years, Americans will not be buying cars and that most of us will be getting around in these electric vehicle things without drivers. Um, but step back and think about it. If it really was 10 times cheaper, what would be the impact on the market? And I asked, Three car people, experts in the last couple of years, when am I going to get one of these apps where I can dial up, you know, my, my car where I live in upstate rural New York, and I can get one of these things to come pick me up, drive me to work, and it's going to be cheaper than my driving my pickup. And they all said the same year. They all said 2023. So just to summarize this part, uh, we're trying to create sort of an engagement among young people of a vision of a world that's very different in 10 years, that's radically different in 10 years, because it has to be, right? If we're gonna solve climate by 2030, the world cannot look in 10 years like it looks today in some important ways. And in particular, how we get our electrons, and how we get around is gonna to have to change. Now that doesn't change our lifestyles. I mean, we still get hot showers and cold beer, but that's, those two sectors are gonna to have to be very different. Um, and what's, Interesting and exciting about this moment, and different from two years ago or four years ago, certainly, is that we now have powerful market forces pushing us towards climate solutions. Up until now, it was all about government policy and incentivizing these technologies and hoping they would get cheap enough, and we did it. We actually got there. And now these technologies are cheaper than the conventional options and getting cheaper. And this means you've got powerful profit motives driving towards solar dominance and autonomous EV ride sharing, all right? But the market alone won't get us there fast enough. This isn't a market optimist story, a market alone optimist story. 
still going to require lots and lots of citizen action, civic engagement, educated citizenry, everybody in America talking about climate change. And that's why we, uh, David and I, have been working to set up this Solve Climate by 2030 project. Uh, so we're going to pause now, I think, David, for some questions, and then we'll move on to your part of the show. Right. So even the first question in the chat, and the way we're going to um, do the questions is to um, just ask you to type in the questions rather than, than call them in. And uh, if you uh, don't have access, if, if you're doing this through your phone or something, you can um, email solveclimate2030 uh, at gmail.com and uh, we'll, we'll answer um, later. We're not going to monitor that right now. But so even the first question um, is one that I've wondered about, which is what about rural areas um, in terms of the ride share and the- Yeah. Space? Well, they'll be last to go because that's, those, that's where the density doesn't really work. But this is a software play. It's, it's so the other way you get to driverless cars, I love this model. So Elon Musk last year said that next year, which means probably the next year, um, uh, you'll be able to buy a $35,000 Tesla, which will make you $200,000 over five years as a taxi, right? So you buy the car, you plug it in at night, and then you unplug it in the morning, and then it drives around all day and picks people up and drops them off. And then it comes home at night, and you put it to bed, and you plug it back in. And you gotta, you know, you know, clean the Pepsi out of the back seat, right? Uh, this can happen anywhere in the U.S. And maybe you don't make two hundred thousand dollars because you don't have the density, but you make a hundred thousand dollars, right? So this is not a, this is really it's a software development that you know anybody, any small entrepreneur in any small town could buy one of those vehicles and put it to work for herself, right? So. That's why it can penetrate into rural areas much faster than you would sort of imagine. It doesn't require an Uber or Lyft sort of corporation to do it. Okay, so individual entrepreneurs yep. using, using their own autonomous vehicles to uh, generate revenue for themselves when they're not using them. Or, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, another question even is, what, is, what effects are policy having on growth of solar? Um, for example, the loss of uh, tax incentives, uh, the, the new tariffs, and, and things like that. Yeah. You know, you can slow this stuff down, um, but if you think of something falling in price 10% every year, that just slows it down. You know, if the tariffs go up 10%, which they did, then a year later, you know, you've recovered that cost difference. Um, and so, you know, with utility scale solar, we're there. I mean, that technology, unsubsidized, is going to crush fossil fuel going forwards. We're on the margins, right, around distributed. So currently, you know, the subsidy policies in place are helpful. We're not really there yet in all parts of the world. But, for example, you know, in Queensland, Australia, they're already at 25% market penetration for rooftop solar. Um, so they're already there. Um, so there's different markets that are moving at different speeds. And um, it's really the power of geometric price declines. Right. It's four years ago, solar was way too expensive, but it comes down in price 10 percent every year. And now it's at parity. Ten, four years from now, it'll be 40 percent cheaper. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the moment that we're living at. And what it means is that 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 sort of subsidy policy has done its work. Um, it still is helpful on the margins, but we were crossing that threshold where we don't really need it as much anymore, which is great. So so. Um the, the flip side of that is that uh, I don't remember what the figures are, something like for f subsidies for fossil fuels, I think nationally it's like $20 billion and, and, and some states um, have uh, either direct or indirect subsidies to, to fossil fuels. So how, and, and, and uh, even didn't really describe his background, but as, as you can tell, he's an economist. So uh, go ahead, even talk. If you could talk about I mean, the, they're, they're outrageously the large, um, and we spend, you know, how much money do we spend? We were just ready to, you know, march into Saudi Arabia to defend our oil fields over there, right? So the amount of money that we put into that is obscene, um, and people have been trying for years to reduce those subsidies. And the good news now is that's kind of irrelevant. Um, again, because we've succeeded on the other public policy front, 
How do we get cheap solar? How do we get cheap batteries? How do we get cheap electric vehicles? Well, it's because the Germans and the Americans and the Chinese and the Danish subsidize those technologies and, uh, you know, directly and indirectly for 20 or 30 years. And it's like they're all arriving on the scene right when we need them. Um, and they're all technologies that are, continue to, are going to continue to get cheaper, right? That's what's really exciting. It's not just parity. They're going to be well below parity with, um, with the conventional technologies in, within the next few years. And, and, and a lot of this is just economies of scale, is that? Yeah, they've hit the point where the economies of scale are kicking in. Um, and yeah, that, 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 that's a lot of it. Um, yeah, you know, they're, they're rent, they're get they're, they're, those achieve those, those scale, scale economies learning by doing. But there's also increase, you know, ongoing technological progress around these things as well. I mean, you know, the, the, if you look at, for just one example, a Prius hybrid plug-in, the 2015 model that I have got 12, 15 miles on the electric. The new ones get 40 on the electric, right? That's three years of, of just flat out progress. They don't cost more, but they're yeah. just much better in three years. Yeah, and, and, and that's another part of this whole picture is uh, efficiency that uh, vehicles are becoming more fuel efficient and certainly um, one can um, reduce the the costs of even cheap uh, um, solar energy by um, putting in uh, um, insulation and things like that to to reduce your own your own lots of complementary technologies. And the, the favorite story I have about sort of the superiority of electric technology in vehicles is there was a team of Swiss graduate students who built an electric car that beat a poor spider in a drag race. Right. This is the best that German engineering could do over 120 years trying to fine tune the power of an internal combustion engine. And five Swiss graduate students built an electric car that beat it flat out in a drag race. Oh. Um, so we've got electric trucks coming on that, you know, folks in red states who are working on farms are going to love these things. They got way more torque. They're more powerful. They're it's sort of a very exciting technologies. Okay, so a couple more questions. As long as we're talking about the transportation. Um, so what about public transportation? What about traffic? Okay, there's a lot of justice questions here in this transition, right? Um, that we have to, as, as citizens, have to make sure that we're on top of this because it's coming and we got to make sure that the technologies, we shape the technologies so that they're so socially beneficial and not destructive. And kind of the good story about driverless and mass transit would be that either it solves the last mile problem for low income folks and helps them get back and forth to the transit stops or else it just kind of creates a much more efficient transit system, right? Because these things don't have to be owned by Uber and Lyft. They can be owned by New York city or Denver. Right. Um, and you know, instead of having giant buses that shuttle around half empty and that don't go to people's doorsteps, you can create a system that actually picks people up where they live because it's much cheaper. Right. So the good story here is that low-income people get access to transportation that they've never had before um, and much more high quality and, and much better service. Um, the bad story would be that people start defecting to Ubers and Lyfts and that's, uh, you know, kind of reduces ridership on conventional mass transit and that becomes a huge headache. Um, so again, it's a transition that we all have to be engaged in and manage so that the good outcome happens and not the bad one. Yeah, and, and I can see that uh, there there may be a, a, a dynamic between the um, <laughs> the public transportation and the single passenger vehicles because somebody asked about traffic that if if the traffic becomes more congested, like where I am in yeah. um, suburban Maryland, going to downtown D.C., that you don't want to drive to downtown D.C. Uh, um, the economics are such that the parking is very expensive, but um, as there's more traffic, there's also going to be more incentive for, for using public transportation where that's available. Yeah, but also you can use um, the, the, these, these vehicles, obviously, pooling would be the, the, the cheaper way to go, and why wouldn't you do that, right? So th that, that's why you reduce traffic, 
is because you're going to use those vehicles much more efficiently. Um, so rather than having all of those single occupancy vehicles out there, people would tend to pool because, you know, you'll, you'll have a much cheaper subscription um, if you do that. Okay. Well, I think why don't we, if people have additional questions and comments on um, this first part of the presentation, keep using the chat function and even can uh, respond to those by um, type, him, he'll, be, he'll be typing in the chat function. But why don't we transition and I'm going to talk a little bit about the project here now. So the, this project and, and, and really even is the one who has uh, um, put this all together. I've, I've just joined with forces to help to make it happen. It's based on um, a, a mass uh, climate change education effort that uh, um, even um, organized back 10 years ago on um, called Focus a Nation on, on Climate Change. And uh, actually, if, I don't know if we have a, I think somewhere on here there's something I, where you can raise your hand if you actually have participated in. Um, Oops. And Andrew, where, where is, where is the, the hand raising function? Just curious here. Yeah, it would be under the participants portion. Yeah, so, so, so I'm, I'm just, if, 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 you have part, if you did participate in the focus of nation on climate change, how, how would they raise their hand and just indicate that? I just want to do a quick little poll here. Yeah, so if they go to the um, Zoom controls, under the participants window, there should be a place to raise their hand in there. Or at least say yes, no. All right, I don't see that. Well, well. anyway, let's go, go ahead. Um, so anyway, so this is modeled on, it was a one day national teach-in on climate change, because back in 2009, <laughs> Believe it or not, there really was very little climate change education going on at colleges and universities and, and relatively little awareness. And that still is um, pretty much the case outside of the environmental and sustainability fields. And we'll, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but so over 100,000 people participated in one day teach-ins organized on individual campuses and the idea of having a one day thing was to kind of get, build the momentum, get everybody excited, get everybody to actually commit to doing something. And so, um, and, and some of you may have participated in, in that, um, that you organize multidisciplinary um, presentations, teaching. So one of the things is it's not just about the science, um, even talked a lot about the, the economics, but also when we're talking, you mentioned the, the climate justice and economic justice issues. So that brings in uh, um, social sciences, that brings in um, philosophy. There also, when you're talking about climate change, that um, there are roles in terms of looking at climate fiction, um, history, so a role for the humanities as well. So this project builds on, on that and has several elements. Um, starting, well really it's already started that we, we have speakers and I know some of you on the call have signed up for our speakers network. Um, we invite you to, to sign up if you would like to be a speaker. We have a, um, a sample PowerPoint that you can use in that a lot of the slides that even presented are really the bulk of that PowerPoint presentation, but then there's, there's a little bit of additional background. And so um, you can become an instant expert or maybe, maybe you're already an expert. Um, give, give a talk. If you are um, at an institution that would like to have a speaker, again, you can go on to the website and uh, will help to connect you with the speaker in, in your, your geographic area. Um, we're also building on this model of the uh, focus in nation. We're encouraging 
um, colleges and universities and other organizations to do these, um, organize these one night teach-ins about climate change um, challenges and solutions. And again, we're trying to encourage this to be, um, certainly you have to start with, with scientific uh, and technical information, but everybody has a role to play. And, and I think this is one of the exciting things for your students. You know that uh, there's tremendous interest on um, probably every uh, campus and, and um, every community. So how do, you, how do you reach the students who are not your, your majors? How do you reach the students who are not gonna be taking an environmental science or an earth science uh, course um, or, or an environmental engineering, how do you reach them? Well, one way would be to organize an event, um, you know, maybe do it in the afternoon or in the evening, and you invite uh, half a dozen faculty members from different uh, disciplines to just give five minute presentations on, or 10 minute presentations, no faculty members can only talk for just five minutes, um, but to give a presentation about sort of climate um, and energy uh, solutions and challenges um, in their area and then open it up to discussion. And you'll find that your students would be really excited to have an opportunity to just kind of learn more and talk with you about that. Why don't we go to the next one and we'll talk about the, the big thing, which is then on April 7th, 2020, what we're calling the power dialogue. And the idea is, again, um, have this focused point where everybody will be talking, um, learning about climate, energy, energy transitions, how do we really um, make that change that Eben was just talking about? How do we facilitate that in our own, um, institutions in our own states in our own communities and, and ultimately nationally and so the model on this is that we are recruiting 52 um, statewide um, webinars that will and we say 52 because it also includes uh, the district of columbia and puerto rico and that maybe we can even uh, reach out to uh, um, American Samoa um, to participate in, in the Virgin Islands. So it may even be a little more than, than 52. But the idea is that we are recruiting a host institution which will organize a 45 minute webinar and um, webcast that and then to have as many other institutions in the state listen to that and then have their own dialogue. So why don't we flip to the next page for the, um, the details of this. Nope, go back one. So on April 7th at uh, 7 o'clock Eastern, um, even we'll, we'll do a, a little bit of a, a national introduction and then our um, host institutions will have this virtual panel on transforming energy in our state, give a little bit of the introduction to uh, solar energy and uh, storage and uh, the opportunities for transition, talk about some of the policy issues um, in the state, what are, you know, what are the current barriers that need to be addressed, what are the um, efforts to do that. So for example, in Maryland where I live, last year the, the state passed a bill called the Clean Energy Jobs Act that mandates 50% uh, um, renewables by um, 2030, um, I believe, yes. And then this year, there's a legislation that's gonna be introduced on uh, um, community choice aggregation or what we're calling clean choice energy to enable a, um, a city or a town or even a county to do bulk purchase of solar or renewable energy, and that would be the default for that community. And so rather than having to, um, to make a conscious decision to 
purchase wind or solar for your home, the default would be renewable and you would have to actually opt out. So that's an example of a policy issue that might be talked about. And then the question is, well, how do you really make that happen in the state? So each state will be a little bit different. Um, Wyoming, for example, um, in Oklahoma are probably gonna be a little more focused on wind energy, just because that's a, those are big, big wind resources. And then um, we encourage each of the participating institutions to have their own event. So you would spend the first hour, you know, invite students and others to come to um, an auditorium, listen to the, the first hour presentation, and then the second hour, um, have your own breakout discussions, uh, maybe do it in a way in a room where there are small tables for people to sit and talk and brainstorm and what what is needed what how do you move forward and then we're going to ask everybody to report back on what are their big ideas you know what what needs to what could be done and we will aggregate those and share them and not only will participants be empowered by seeing the opportunity but also see the um, some of the paths forward in the policy, and of course, it, uh, um, it it's not entirely coincidental that we're doing this in 2020, which is an election year. And so, um, you know, if if people want to then take these ideas and introduce them to candidates for office in their community or in their state or even nationally, that they're can be a community developed energy transition agenda that can be promoted to candidates. Next please. So we're, we're getting there in terms of the 52 hosts. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, if you, you see this slide and uh, your state is not there, um, we're, we're still looking for some, some hosts. If you do have a host, um, that's great because then you can um, participate with them, they'll organize the first hour, and then it's on your own to do the, the second hour in a, in a, uh, a sharing way. Um, even do you want to say anything about yeah, that? Yeah, so I would add, David, that um, um, we're really viewing this as kind of part of the psychology or motivation here is that, you know, probably 80% of the faculty on your campuses care about climate change, like seriously care about it because um, they're reading about it, they're worried about it, and they would like to have a way to talk with their students about it. Um, and so what, this is really just a super easy way to do that. So ideally what we'd like you to do would be to reach out to all of your colleagues on campus, and we'll send out some emails about how to do this in November or December, um, and say, you know, mark that night of Tuesday, April 7th on your calendar and assign this as homework. Uh, for your class and you can do it collectively. You can all watch at the same time uh, and do it live or you could assign his homework the night before and then have a conversation about it in class the next day. And as David said, what you're going to hear in Tennessee or New Jersey or Idaho is what you're going to hear is three big things that could happen in your state in the next couple of years. Ambitious but feasible things that would really help move the needle towards, you know, solving climate by 2030. And, um, and then we'll send out a template for discussion afterwards that will involve, you know, students with sticky notes breaking up into groups of five and, and really saying, well, I've heard that, you know, what is, how do I, you know, is there anything I need to do as a student or is this just something politicians will do or is there, you know, should I go talk to my college president or should we all collectively go down and sit in in our electric utility until they do something? So those are the ideas that we want to bubble up. But beyond that, you know, as a, a philosopher, you know, you, you could be, that's a really interesting question to engage. Should you do something or should you not? What is your obligation? Or as a political scientist, it's obviously an interesting exercise uh, that you can talk about with your students afterwards in terms of after they've gone through it, you know, this is what engaged, you know, sort of citizenry is like. Or... As an economist, you might say, well, we heard three things. Which of those do you think is the most cost-effective? Which is going to give us the biggest bang for the buck? 
or, you know, as a biologist, you could say, well, why did they leave out sequestration? You know, we think that's important or regenerative agriculture. So, or as an artist, you could even say, well, we did this exercise. Now I want you to respond uh, in clay <laughs> or, you know, in oil paint. Um, so we, we really think that this is an opportunity for anybody on the faculty who would like to figure out how they could incorporate a little climate change conversation into their dialogue to just, it's a really easy opportunity. Um, and that's kind of why we think we can get hundreds of thousands of young people talking about climate change that night, but we really need your help. We can't, you know, David and I can't do this. <laughs> we, we really need your help getting everybody on your institution involved and, and everybody statewide involved. And not just that, but high schools, AP environmental science classes, faith groups, civic organizations, anybody can tune in. Right, and, and for example, some of the schools that I've talked with have said, yeah, this, this will be if we connect with the high schools and you know we have uh, the executive director of the National Earth Science Teachers Association is uh, one of the people uh, listening in on the webinar. And, and, and so these universities were very excited. Oh yeah, let's, this will be a great recruiting thing for us if we can connect with our, our local schools and to get them to, um, you know, maybe ass assign the uh, participating or, or give extra credit for participating and then have a discussion in, in class uh, afterwards. Um, why don't you go to the next one and I do want to respond to one of the comments. Yeah, I, actually please continue to put stuff in the chat if you've got questions. Yeah. So, so there are a lot of different things that you can do, but I also want to just respond that, um, you know, yes, we are focusing really on the, the solar plus storage as um, a, a transformative technology that can, can happen very quickly, but we also, in our uh, um, basic presentation, we do talk about Project Drawdown and um, the, the multiple, there's a, a hundred different uh, climate solutions in that. And so the idea is to, to focus and show that there, there is some realistic um, optimism for transformation and use that as a launching point to then talk about other things. We're, we're not trying to, to, to limit, but we're trying to start with, with, with this, uh, believe it or not, relatively low hanging fruit and move from there. So this lists in a number of ways that uh, you can get involved, um, whether you're a faculty member, whether you're a student or community member, whether you're with an NGO, and, and then also looking for, for lead institutions. And you know we, we are fully aware of how busy faculty members and, and other involved people are. Um, so you know we're that's again the, the collective impact model of if we can all work together to do at least one event at one time that yes there'll be a few people that are going to have to do um, the lead work in terms of organizing the event but it's a relatively low entry way for everybody to at least do something so next please Oops. Oops. So, whoops. <laughs> so, I, so we do have um, on the website, there's a resource section where we have um, various uh, ways to take action. We have videos, uh, the, the presentation that we're um, using for the speakers bureau is there and can be downloaded. And if you have good climate change resources, um, you can send them to us and, and climate education, energy education resources, and we can share them through this website as, as well. So um, I think you need to go back one, actually. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, there we go, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so at this point, um, we wanted to, to turn it back to you a little bit in terms of find out, I mean, one of the fun things for me in talking with people around the country and uh, um, recruiting um, organizers is to just find out about the things that are going on in the, the different states. For example, um, we have uh, 
one of our, our hosts is, who's on the webinar is from the Khan Center for Renewable Energy at the University of Louisville. And, you know, I thought, oh yeah, you know, Kentucky, that's going to be, that's a pretty tough state because of the, the dominance of the coal industry. But in fact, there's a lot of really exciting work going mm on um, in, in academic institutions in Kentucky. And, and so this will be a chance for them to, to show that uh, there really is a new face of, of Kentucky that is being developed when it comes to climate and energy. So if you'd like to uh, use the, the chat function and just, uh, um, you know, maybe just give us a couple of bullet points in terms of things that you're involved in now or hearing about this uh, opportunity, are there ways that you're thinking this might help to advance what you're maybe already doing in, in terms of uh, clean energy and uh, um, climate solutions? So feel free to, to use the, the chat um, to do that. And, and why don't you um, go to two slides now ahead, even while we're waiting for, for anybody to comment. So um, this is all very easy to, to get involved. Um, everything is, is through the website, uh, solveclimatebyt2030.org. Um, contact uh, even or myself, uh, directly and we will be more than pleased to um, answer individual questions, uh, help put you in touch with your, your state organizers, and also we're really interested in just hearing what ideas you have. So um, here's uh, Lauren from Maine saying that three quarters of Maine's net electricity generation comes from renewable sources already, which is amazing. I did not realize that. So, so in, in Maine, there you all are, are well, well on, on the way towards. Uh, the, the, the trick in Maine now will be to get everybody off of fuel oil um, and onto electric heating systems, right? And then build out your your renewables to sort of uh, address the heating question. Um, yeah, so always another always another sector. Yeah, it's both the fuel oil and natural gas. Yeah. To, yeah, so it's it's not enough to just have the electrical system powered by the sun and the wind, but then it's also trying to electrify everything um, and 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 capturing the sun. So, for example, we at, at our home, if I use the the oven or the microwave, I'm uh, um, heating my food, uh, cooking my food by the sun. If I use my stove, I'm still uh, heating it and cooking it by fossil fuels because okay. we have a, a gas stove at this point. So here, here's another um, comment from uh, Elena that uh, Global Shapers Cleveland, a hub of the Young Professional Initiative, the World Economic Forum, is hosting the first ever regional convening of youth. They're defining youth as ages 13 to 30. So I'm almost there, but a little bit over. Um, in Northeast Ohio for a Youth Climate Action Summit in fall 2020. And I will have to uh, learn more about that because my daughter uh, just graduated from a, a college in Ohio last year, but is, is still very connected with, with people doing those things. Yeah, I was just doing a, a tour out in Northeast Ohio. I spoke at Akron and Youngstown, and so there's a lot of interest among students there. Um, and I'm glad to connect you to the people that I know in that area. Right, and then here's uh, um, Ray saying at the Loyola University of Chicago, student activist groups, uh, especially organized through the Sunrise Movement, are focused on the food system, um, reducing waste and um, composting, um, the building is geothermal. They turn waste oil into fuel in a biodiesel lab, so waste cooking oil, um, supporting local food systems with urban gardens and farmers market, supporting circular economy models, et cetera. And he loves the energy from the students at Loyola University of Chicago. And I think, you know, this is really the good news model, the good news that um, we need to help to aggregate 
is that uh, there is so much that is going on. I mean, I remember um, I used to be with the National Council for Science and the Environment, and at our national conference in 2003 um, on education for sustainability, David Orr uh, challenged the, the campus community to practice what we teach. And within that uh, 15, 16 year period, there really has been a revolution on, on campuses, but um, it's, I don't think it's as recognized by society as it needs to be. So I hope that this <coughs> um, project will help to do that. So even do you have any uh, concluding uh, um, comments before we uh, turn it over to uh, um, Andrew for, for final words from NAGT? Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, we're all toggling between sort of this climate despair and um, the desire to make a difference in the world in the next few years because we recognize that we don't have a lot of time. Um, and, uh, and the fact that we're all overloaded with teaching and research and, you know, kids and the, all of that stuff. Um, and... Uh, but I think, you know, I've had a lot of people come up to me since that, that report came out last year and said, you know, what can I do? I mean, I get it. I hear this. We have 10 years. What am I supposed to do? And I think as educators in particular, we really need to step up and we have to figure out strategies to, to move beyond just the, the, you know, 20 or 30 people who are in our environmental studies majors or who are taking our classes. Um, and, uh, and we have to do it together. Um, so this is a first step along that journey. Um, please, you know, help us get the word out. We'll have Instagram and Twitter and all of those tools. So follow us. Don't delete our emails. Pass them along. Be a bit of a pest. You know, make sure you get all your colleagues uh, on board with this. Um, and, uh, and Akron is indeed, yeah, already a, a university working closely with us. So, um, so just and look and forward to your, your ideas too. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is, this, this, this is a multi-way project. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you have any suggestions on how this could work better on your campus models blog for us, you know, we'd love to have your blog post about what's going on in your campus on our resource page. Just, we got to create, create a movement here. So thanks for your help. Yeah. Thank you for your time today. And, uh, even, and I will, will stay on, the, the webinar for a few more minutes if people have other yeah. comments that you want to share or questions. And so Andrew, you want to give us any final uh, comments from NAGT in terms of, uh, we'd love to get your evaluations and uh, upcoming events here. You can just keep going, David. You're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so there are upcoming webinars just next week. There's actually two next week, one on Wednesday and one on Thursday. And so kind of to your point, so the next one on Wednesday is about advocacy, advocacy 101, engaging policymakers and promoting the inclusion of geoscience perspective. So if you're looking, trying to think about motivating people and getting that geoscience perspective, that's a good place to start kind of learning about those things. Um, and then also NASA resources supporting um, instruction of NGSS Earth System Phenomena. So this is part of the NGSS um, monthly webinar series uh, that's long standing now. Um, typical time Thursday um, in November 7th. And so please do fill out the webinar survey. And with that, we're at the end of the hour. Thank you everyone. And thank you both of you for presenting such a riveting talk today. Well, thanks Andrew for setting this up. So bye everybody, let's stay in touch.